Okay, I guess we can start. So welcome everyone to um, TCS Plus talk and we have Richard Peng to kick off the semester. Um, he'll be talking about solving sparse linear systems faster than matrix multiplication. And before we start, let me remind you that there'll be a talk next Wednesday by Fotis Iliopoulos from the IAS. Um, and yeah, and just, yeah, feel free to unmute yourself. And if you have suggestions for talks that you'd like to see on TCS Plus, then please like suggest them on the website. But okay, Richard. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me? Is working? Awesome. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you uh, to the organizers for, uh, for inviting me to give this talk and for setting this up. And thanks to you all for, for signing in. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, the problem of uh, solving a system of linear equations. So just to, uh, to formalize what I'm saying is that I'm dealing with an n by n matrix. So it's an n by n matrix. I have n and z non-zeros. I have a length n vector b. And I want to find x such that ax equal to b up to some high accuracy. So up to machine epsilon round off errors. Uh, as, a, as a brief uh, stand, uh, I'll, I'll, as I will be using matrices and vectors quite often in this talk, I'll be using bold for vectors and capital N bold for matrices. Just also want to check, uh, can everyone see the cursor on my screen as I mouse over the slides? Cool. Okay, just want yeah. to make sure that that's also visible. Richard, what is Z, NNZ? Just some... A number of non-zeros. So this is uh, the, the typical like MATLAB Julia R command for asking how sparse a matrix is. And because I'm dealing with sparse matrices, I'll be using NNZ as a separate quantity. This is just for okay. the number of non-zeros. So this is a problem that uh, has uh, has many applications, most of which predates the use of computers. So examples of this include in engineering, you have uh, forces and you want to look at how the forces balance on an object. And this diagram here is uh, the force diagram of one of these cathedrals. And the way that we're, they were able to build very tall buildings is that they're able to get the force to exactly balance out on these structures. Uh, they're used in management. So operations research type things, um, things like uh, shipping of goods and then supply demand questions. In fact, the abacus actually comes with a guide on how to deal with linear systems. So it probably makes it one of the oldest computation devices. Linear system showed up in data science, uh, at least as, as, as early as the use of, uh, uh, I mean, they, they sh one of the kind of the earliest example of data science is astronomy. So they have like many decades of observation observations and they want to try to extrapolate the orbit. So you're actually dealing with an interpolation problem. And uh, they're one of the kind of the big advances instead of, they realize instead of the orbits being circles, they're actually ellipses. And the way that they get ellipses is by finding this two by two matrix. And there's quite a bit of linear algebra involved there as well. And that led to a, month, led, that led to a whole bunch of other things like uh, uh, gravity equations and so on. So these are some of the earliest applications of linear systems and they have in many ways laid the foundation for things like engineering, operations research and data science. And with the, with the advent of computers, uh, what we can now do is we can do all three of them simultaneously inside a video game. So this is the, so the, the game that I'm mentioning here is Kerbal Space Program where you can build rockets, uh, set up uh, flight plans and then look at all the parameters of your rockets and then tweak them. So this is a bit of a funny take on modern applications of linear systems, but at least there's one thing there, which is that computer graphics is actually another one of these huge applications of linear systems in that there what you really care about is how light gets manipulated. So the, so the rendering of light, shadows, diffraction, so on. And the way I understand it is that a lot of, a lot of these new special effects, what they are is that they rely on having better graphics engines. There are also these uh, comics about how much people's understanding of orbital mechanics improved once they played, when they did all three of these activities simultaneously in a video game. But uh, you can probably find that on XKCD. On the other hand, though, computers, aside from really popularizing concepts related to linear systems, 
computers also led to a lot of other things, which is that A, the fact that video games need to solve linear systems means that we have to solve a lot more linear systems. So there are a lot of high level programming languages have solving linear systems built in as single commands. We also get much larger data sizes. So nowadays, instead of just uh, the non-zero structures of, of a table, what you have is the links on the internet. So you, have, you basically get very massive matrices. Computers also let, leads to whole, all sorts of different robustness requirements. For example, sometimes you, your linear systems exist on diff, three different data centers across the globe. Your linear systems, some of your entries are corrupted. Your entries are slowly changing, and, or sometimes you only have some kind of certainty. So you also have a lot of robustness requirements. So all these things lead to, uh, lead to, a, lot, uh, lead to a whole host of new requirements on um, what we need for a linear system solving algorithm. And the one that I want to start with is probably the one that we have most of a, it's, it's probably one of the most common forms of linear system solving is, well, this is one of the most common uh, settings in which a linear system arise is in data science. So the, the thing that's often done there is you do some kind of regression, which is that you have some points, you want to fit a line or a curve through them, or you want to fit some kind of correlated distribution. And when we think about multivariate correlated distributions, the, I claim the distribution that we most often think of for worse is the Gaussian distribution. Turns out the Gaussian distribution was actually not the first, was not the first multivariate distribution introduced. The Laplace distribution actually predates Gaussian distribution by about 100 years. So, so then there's a kind of a natural question. I mean, these days we also know that for a lot of settings, Laplace distributions are actually better. So one of the questions is why is Gaussian distribution so widely used? And one of the reasons there is that it actually came with an algorithm. So Gaussian distribution was released together with an algorithm, how to efficiently do, do uh, maximum likelihood estimates known as a Gaussian elimination. So Gaussian elimination, the idea is that you want to uh, manipulate matrices by adding columns so that the matrices are fewer and fewer non-zeros. Of course, this is an algorithm that has been rediscovered many, many times. And some of the earlier iterations was not even written Arabic numbers. So the example I shown, I'm shown here is actually from one of the earliest publications on Gaussian elimination. And it's using a number system that's actually shown below. So the idea is you want to simplify matrices by adding together rows and columns. And what happened here is I took a, co a copy of column three added to column one and I got rid of a noun zero. So I got rid of this entry. Matrices have n squared entries. Every one of these operations take linear time. So in modern asymptotic complexity, so I'm using standard big O complexity. This is an algorithm that has n squared memory and takes time n cubed. For a lot of these smaller to intermediate instances, for example, the kind of the earlier things that one would want to fit a Gaussian to, this is more than good enough you can basically do most of these computations in a single afternoon. And that's kind of one of, the, one of the advantages of having Gaussian distribution is that it was just very easy to run the squares regression on it. Where for some of the more complicated distributions, you actually need convex optimization, which is why we're not using them that often until now. And I'll actually come back to this later on as well. But one of the big surprises in algorithm design that when, once people started analyzing these, in, these things in terms of asymptotics, is actually Gaussian elimination is not optimal. So this started with what's called direct methods for solving linear systems, which is I want to compute some representation of A inverse. And starting with work by Strassen, oh, that's almost, that's actually more than a half a century ago, uh, leading to all the way to, there was some work uh, in the past decade by Stothers, Vasily Vaskovic, Vasilevska Williams and also Legal, uh, that basically got this number to uh, 2.372864. So this is known as the matrix multiplication time. So n to the omega time. Sorry, Richard. So I think we're experiencing a little bit, it's cutting you off at some points. So maybe if you can turn off the video, it may help. Okay, let me get rid of my video. It's been fine so far, but just may help a little bit. Yeah, let me get rid of my video. 
Okay, so yeah, for uh, for direct methods, which are these methods that compute A inverse, there has been a lot of work, and it turns out that matrix inversion, matrix multiplication, computing these factorizations, they're all roughly equivalent to each other in terms of asymptotic complexity. And uh, what you get is you get algorithms that run in time that is about 2.37. In practice, this number is closer to somewhere between 2.7 to 2.8. But there's some huge caveats with using this type of methods. The first is that it uses n squared memory. So the idea is that these methods, they explicitly generate you an inverse of the matrix, which means that, so when you do, when you do these large scale computations, it's actually not, the, the runtime is actually less of a constraint than how much memory you're using. And these methods, uh, the issue is that their, their memory grows quadratic in the, uh, in the size of the of the matrix. Now, did I just lose my Zoom? Am I still on the call? Yeah, yeah, we, we have you. You're good. Uh -huh. Okay, hold yeah, on. Yeah, we can hear you. My Zoom just locked myself out, which is really weird. Hold on, this is really weird. Okay, now it's back. This is strange. I think we, we still see your screen and we can hear yeah, you. No, it, uh, it logged, my Zoom logged me out for some funny reason that I don't understand. And I'm not seeing the, huh, okay, this is really weird. Okay, as long as it's working, it's good because I'm, I'm not seeing the, the pen with everyone's, it, it, I think it might've been, um, might have to do with my video, me turning off my video. I think it's because uh, you can turn the video off. Uh, okay. okay, cool. Yeah, so so kind of one of the, the issues that a direct method faces, so these inversion-based methods, is that uh, they, they have a, they, they, they really require writing down the inverse. And what's very common is matrices whose, if you have these very large sparse matrices. So typically a typical, range of numbers is that your dimension is about 100 million, your, your non-zeros is about a billion. These are not ones where the, the inverse would actually fit in memory. So this leads to the question of, is it possible to do better than direct methods? And uh, the main result I will present in this, uh, in this talk is that for this current matrix multiplication exponent of 2.373, uh, we can solve polynomially conditioned linear systems with n and z non-zeros to one over poly n accuracy. So, so uh, in time that is roughly n and z to the 2.331. So the precise runtime is n and z to the uh, five omega minus four divided by omega plus one times log squared kappa. And this uh, condition number assumption, this is a typical assumption that's made in numerical analysis. And the reason this is made is that you assume that your, uh, the, the size of your numbers are also poly n. And uh, this is the simplest way to, like this, this is the assumption that's essentially needed to make sure that your algorithm still works with doubles and you don't have to generate your own floating point numbers to make this all work. And uh, the two main pieces, uh, algorithmic pieces that lead to this uh, complexity is that it's the first thing is a block Krylov space method. So it's a, some, it's a variant of conjugate gradient that basically does a whole bunch of vectors at a time. And then the next piece is matrix anti-concentration bounds. There are some caveats to this result. The first is that uh, it still needs n squared memory it's not storing n squared numbers anymore, but the problem is that the amount of precision that's needed for it, uh, the, the, the bound we prove is still n squared. But it's only really, it's actually storing a number of non zeros that is a number of entries that is sub quadratic. And so, uh, this leads to the next caveat, which is that likely we have a suboptimal precision analysis. Clement, so, uh, yeah, there's just a question uh, somewhere in the chat. Uh, poly n, asking if poly n is also the condition number or poly n is just the desired uh, accuracy? Is there a relation between the two? Oh, 
Uh, so, so they, they are weakly related in that once you are able to solve a linear system to accuracy that is less than its condition number, you are able to boost this. So you are able to amplify the, the, the accuracy just massively. So one doesn't lead to the other. Uh, there, are some, there are some results that say that I can solve any linear system to, uh, to a constant accuracy in some other norm. So the, so the way that this is set up is that this kind of bound, it ignores a lot of this kind of like low error, doesn't amplify kind of situation. So there is this, there's this scenario where it's easy to get the first couple of bits, but, but in a kind of a fairly non-robust manner. And those bounds, uh, you, what you should refer to is you, sh you should look at the, uh, some of the ways that gradient descent is stated. So you look at the, like the standard like, if you look at like the standard, the standard smoothness assumptions on gradient descent, and you translate that to a linear system solver, you can say something about, I can get some accuracy that is slightly better than the norm of my initial B vector. But those are things that don't amplify. So poly N to poly N, what this does is that uh, these two polys aren't, aren't related. So I can set this poly to be more than this poly so that the accuracy is enough for boosting. Thanks. Richard, what's the notion of accuracy here? Oh, the accuracy to norm error. error. So the other, the other thing about this kind of one over poly accuracy is that you can essentially ignore the, like the accuracy is essentially the two norm between the, the, the vector you return and the true answer. So this is kind of the, the, the stable kind of setup in that uh, what you once you have accuracy that is less than condition number, essentially it just, it's, a, it's able to translate it in, in any way. Oh, and by the way, the condition number, what it is, is the max over mean singular value. I haven't gotten to it yet, but it's the standard way that numerical analysis measures stability of their problems. So the, the other reason that we consider the poly n condition case is that uh, if, you're, if your condition number is more than that, you actually need extra bits. So like there you get to this kind of like fixed point versus floating point versus different, rep like different representations of your floating point numbers start to matter. So the polyon condition is a typical case that a lot of these uh, weekly polynomial time algorithms consider. Other questions? No, I think that's all for now. Okay. So the way that I will structure this talk is that uh, I'll first talk about iterative methods. So basically the, the overall algorithmic outline of what's being solved. Then I'll talk about how we improve iterative methods through the use of structured matrices. So we look for additional structures in the problems that let us speed up these iterative methods. And I'll finish by discussing the numerical precisions that's, that's kind of that underlies our current analysis. Essentially, that's the limiting aspect of our current analysis of these methods. So iterative methods, uh, these are methods that's widely used in practical linear system solving. So some of the problems, so linear systems uh, show up a lot in engineering and uh, some of the large systems that's being solved are things like protein folding. So this is like automated drug design you have. So you have some protein and you want to figure out how it folds onto itself and what kind of molecule it forms. Uh, you get uh, things coming out of nuclear reactors. So the picture on the bottom left, that's a neutron simulation. In a, that's a neutron density of a nuclear reactor. These vertical columns, these are actually control rods. The one on the right is actually one of my favorite examples of, uh, of uh, uh, engineering that's constrained by performance of linear system solving. So this is a, this is the result of a paper from the 60s that says that if you structure objects, objects in a certain way, you can have uh, electromagnetic waves, namely radar waves, diffract off them in ways that completely cancel each other. But to model this calculation, it's, it just gets super expensive to, uh, to computation-wide. So when they actually first designed the aircraft, they, 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 wrote, they wrote up their program. They put it in a super supercomputer. They realized they can only handle something like five or six surfaces. So the, the, then they designed this aircraft called the, the, what, what they called a hopeless diamond. And then there was all sorts of wagers on whether they could ever make this thing fly. But the fact that it was like six shapes, six diamonds, 
well, it was like basically a very, it look, basically it looks like a very bad video game character. It had to do with the fact that, that the computation involving the EM waves on this object is so, so, is so intensive. What these problems all have in common though, is that because they're happening in three dimensional space, you get this extremely sparsely connected objects. In three dimensional space, the kind of the pairwise connection, especially once you start partitioning up 3D space, you get these very sparsely connected objects, but you get these very large ones. So the problem they often deal with is that they, they, they really don't want to write down their inverse. So the method of choice uh, in scientific computing for solving these large linear systems are iterative methods and Krylov spaces. So the idea is actually very much like how we, how, how is very much like gradient descent, which we are probably more familiar with. And the idea is we gradually converge towards a solution. So the picture on the left is typically how we explain gradient descent is that we have some, we have some uh, potential function and we just kind of gradually walk towards the bottom of it. Symbolically, what this does is you take a vector x and you just gradually add the error. So you look at ax minus b and you add a small copy of it to x itself. And what it leads to is it leads to, uh, so there's a couple of observations you can make about this. The first is that if you have the solution, if AX is equal to B, this will never change. So it, it, is a, it, it is a iteration whose fixed point leads to the solution. But, it, but on the other hand, to make this converge, uh, there's all sorts of ways of choosing this coefficient alpha so that it converges well. But from a kind of algorithmic perspective, or kind of stepping back a little bit, what you can realize this method leads to is it leads to the first iteration just zero. The second iteration is some coefficient of b. The third iteration, you took b, and now we multiply by a again. We have b and then a b. So this leads to what's called a Krylov space method, which is that if I take m steps of an iteration, it's going to give me a, in a solution that's spanned in the m step Krylov space. So you get some solution that's in the span of b, a, b, a squared b, all the way to a to the m minus one b. And this is the type of method that, ha that basically, uh, that forms the backbone of all these scientific computing algorithms. Uh, this method is actually a bit of a high art. There's actually a, a paper called Introduction to the Counted Gradient Algorithm Without the Agonizing Pain, edition one and a quarter. So the general idea of what CG does is that it says that M steps of conjugate gradient returns the best possible solution in the M step Krylov space. So for a symmetric matrix A, what you get is that the iteration count is basically the max eigenvalue divided by the min eigenvalue to the power of a half. This is not the setting in which conjugate gradient was first introduced. CG was actually first introduced uh, with M set to N. Which is you just take a full basis. You take B, you take AB all the way to the A to the N minus one B. And what they proved is that this takes about time that is order number of non zero. So every time you multiply by the matrix A, it's just the number of non zeros in the matrix that dominates the cost. So the overall cost of conjugate gradient is something like NNZ times M. When NNZ is close to N, isn't this just order N time? And so this is, uh, this is where, uh, the, so this is where the, the kind of the runtime complexity of a numerical algorithm really comes in. Here the issue is that the, what they actually need is they actually need exact arithmetic or this only works over finite fields. And the generic issue of running this kind of algorithm in a practical setting is that it's essentially equivalent to doing a linear regression on the M step Krylov space matrix. So you're essentially doing a linear regression on B, A, B, A squared B, all the way to A to the M minus one B. So if we think about the numbers in A as being about poly N, what do we get in M steps? We get numbers as large as N to the order M. So we get numbers that need about M words to represent. So there is actually an overhead of M in just storing the representation of your numbers. Which means that n steps of exact CG it leads to a runtime that is n n z times n squared, which in, even in the sparse case brings us once again back to an n cubed time algorithm. 
as you can imagine, once we're in the floating point setting, there is a lot of room to kind of do these roundings. You can kind of try to truncate the numbers. I mean, there's all sorts of things that one could do. And there has indeed been a lot of methods proposed for speeding up this aspect of conjugate gradient. Recently, though, there was a paper by Musco, Musco, and Sitford who showed that many approaches for trying to fix this are still kind of problematic in the worst case. So practically, this is also a very real issue. So in practically, there, so practically there is also in scientific computing, there are two kinds of, there are several kinds of systems which are known as extremely ill-conditioned problems. They also include some of the most, uh, uh, they, they include some extremely useful applications. So things like Maxwell equation. These are basically how you model electromagnetic waves. And then there's what's called hyperbolic equations, which is used in finding oil. Uh, both of these things, they have been done on campuses. Actually, both of these photos are uh, radars and oil rigs on, on, on campuses. But from a practical point of view, if we if you just want to kind of verify and isolate the problem, an instance that is also very uh, representative of the difficulty of solving large sparse linear systems in practice is you just take a random matrix. So this is the instance that if you, if you want to be convinced that this is a fairly non-trivial problem is that you take a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix. You put 10 random non-zeros per row. You get a matrix that's not too well conditioned, but also not too ill conditioned. The condition number is roughly about 10 to the eight. And if you run it with the direct method, things like LAPEC, so the backslashing LAPEC, it's about five seconds. Conjugate gradient, it gets about 26 seconds. Uh, and if you put in incomplete Cholesky's preconditioners, it's still about 3,000 iterations. There are also some methods that's tailored for solving, uh, solving, for solving sparse matrices. But these methods, they also, we couldn't even get them to converge actually. So we couldn't even, we, we couldn't even observe convergence of these methods. So what does our algorithm do, do to get around this issue? The one, uh, one sentence description of what our new algorithm does is that instead of doing Krylov space of a single vector, it takes some random Gaussian matrix G and it generates, uh, M, it basically does N over M of these columns at the same time. So what our algorithm does to get speed ups is that it takes this M by N over M matrix and then it runs M steps of CG on it. So we're still essentially replicating the effect of this kind of full basis conjugate gradient. So this kind of take columns that span everything conjugate gradient, but we only power things up to a power of M now. So the runtime of doing this block CG, so generating this block Krylov space, what the time, the time it takes is still roughly NNZ times N with a poly M factor overhead. But the advantage of this now is that now we're working with M by N over M numbers. So we're working with matrices, that's M by N over M, and we have N of these. And now the cost of working with these matrices becomes uh, N times N over M to the omega minus one times the extra factor of M. So the, this extra factor of M is the number of digits that these numbers need to be kept to. So precisely what we need is we need to keep, so precisely what we need to do is that because this is M steps of conjugate gradient, there are roughly M digits in these numbers. So we get a runtime that looks like N times N over M to the omega minus one times M, which upon manipulation, so you, get, you just collect exponents, you get N to the omega divided by M to the omega minus two. So you get this negative exponent down m times n to the omega, while the other term, which is what's needed to generate the conjugate to, to Krylov space, is n squared times poly m. We have one exponent that's n to the omega with a negative exponent of m, one exponent of n squared with a positive exponent. So we can actually pick m so that the overall term comes out somewhere in between. And that is basically how we get our runtime that's, that is faster than conjugate than both conjugate gradient and matrix inversion. Uh, so, sorry, what, what is the big of one in the exponent of M here? Because you need that to do the balancing, right? 
Oh, so, so the reason there's an extra factor of m, uh, poly m here is that uh, what's happening is that you're multiplying by a, but the problem is I have no idea how many digits are there now. So I'm just assuming that uh, this, this is a term that depends both on the number of non-zeros in G and also how many digits there are. So to, to multiply a, a, a matrix by a vector, it's n and z time. And so, yeah, okay. So to multiply a matrix by a vector, it takes time n and z, but also times the number of digits in the, in the entries of the vector. And the number of digits we will prove is about m. And then the other thing is that, uh, the other thing is, uh, yeah, so the other thing is that you also, you also need to do G transpose against this. So it depends on, the, on, on, on what the density of G is. And the density of G we will show is roughly about N times poly M as well. So that, that's where this term comes, comes from. Uh, the next question is what does the omega minus one exponent represent? So uh, omega minus one of what this is, is So the omega minus one, give me one second. A cost of, it's the cost of multiplying M by N over M matrices. So that's the way you can think about this is that if you, the, the kind of the, the high level way to think about this is that instead of working with N by M matrices, instead of working with N by N matrices, I'm working with N by N over M matrices. So, so this is the, the size of my, of the basis of my Krylov space. So this is the, this, so, so this uh, N by N over M is basically how big every one of these blocks are. So there's a little bit of additional things that needs to be done to make sure that I'm doing, I'm doing things that essentially the cost of manipulating N by N over M matrices instead of N by N matrices. And that's where you get the saving of omega minus one. Oh, how to get around the condition number kappa? Uh, co condition number kappa, we take the logs. Basically, what we do is we just keep that much precision around. So exact, exact inversion, the complexity of exact inversion is n to the omega uh, times log of kappa. And uh, basically in all of these, we track an extra factor of log kappa bits. So all, all of our word lengths have log kappa overheads in them. Other questions? Can you explain how you choose your step length alphas? Oh, the uh, oh, a step length in the iterative method. We actually don't yeah. use iterative methods. So by the alpha, you do you mean? Yeah, because you introduce. Uh, you mean this alpha? Theory. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. The idea here is you they make a basis, right? Uh, and you have this step length, and a here should be positive, definite actually, right? To be to be convergent. Uh, yeah, for this to be convergent, what you need is you need A to be positive definite, yes. Uh, we don't actually pick alpha. We take the view that all we have to do is generate this basis and do a least squares regression in it. So all we do is we say we generate this matrix and then we just do a linear system solve in this matrix. Okay. So we never actually compute alpha because we just say we ge once we generate the full basis, we just do linear regression in this matrix. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, the alpha was just there to, to motivate like what an iterative method looks like. And it sounds like you're very familiar with iterative methods. But we actually kind of take the, we take the 1950s view of, uh, of counted gradient, which is we just let M equal to N. So we just generate a full basis. And once we, we have this full basis, what we do is actually, we actually multiply by another A and then, and then we just solve, we just like do a linear system solve on that entire Krylov space 
matrix. So we essentially the way the view we take is we take a linear regression on this block Krylov space matrix. So why not from the beginning you just take a random basis? Oh, that's what we do. That's that's essentially what we do. So we essentially what we do is we take g and we just do a g a squared g all the way to a to the m minus one g for a random g. Yes, that's ex exactly what we do. Yeah, we actually don't generate Krylov space based on B. What we do is we take this matrix, we multiply by A, we take the grand matrix of that, and we just solve that. And then we can multiply away the effect of this matrix right through more matrix vector multiplies. Yep, so what I meant is like, why don't you say instead of G, A, G, A, a squared G, you say G, G, G1, G2, G, uh, I mean, like just choose random mate. Just oh, if I just choose, a, if I just make them all uncorrelated, the reason that I want oh. them to make them, uh, sorry? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's basically my question. Yeah, so notice that I only want to multiply one M by N over M matrix. Okay. I don't want to multiply M of these. If I multiply by M of these, right, like, the, like I need some, because otherwise, if you make them all uncorrelated, you're basically dealing with an N by N matrix. Mm -hmm. okay. So the, basically the, what the, the kind of the, the interesting part of this algorithm is, is that the fact that they are picked related to the first, the first block means that these things are all correlated and you can actually get some very nice matrix structure out of it. And that's what kind of makes the, that, that's where the speed ups are coming from. Thanks. Thank uh, there's another question. There's no condition on G for the block case. Uh, we will be picking a very special G. The, the G that we pick is actually random Gaussians with sparse entries per column. So it's kind of like, for those familiar with ComSketch matrix, it's basically the sparse ComSketch matrix, but we use some very different properties of it. So we pick a special G, but in general, everything that I'm saying here, they can, they, they are their own class of algorithms. There's a whole class of algorithms called block Krylov. I think typically what people do is that they take their vector B that they're solving and they split it up and then they put it like into a bunch of columns and so on. Uh, like there's many ways to pick your initial starter. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, I have already gotten some questions about why are you setting things up this way? And the reason is that I want to uh, extract some additional structure outside uh, in addition to it's just a block Krylov matrix. So the study of uh, the study of structure matrices really went hand in hand with operations research. So operation research, what they realized, this is also in, this is most, this is a lot of this happened in convex optimization in particular. They realized toward the end of the seventies that a lot of the ways of solving convex optimization, like so the, the fastest ways of solving convex optimization is by solving a sequence of linear systems. So the, in, this in particular led to things like the interior point method that, basically are now behind the run, the fastest run times for things like shortest path and max flow and so on. So there, uh, there were some work by Vaidya uh, in the late eighties. In fact, even the earlier Kamakar papers uh, had some speed ups of, take, of, of speeding up these linear system solves using the fact that the, that the linear systems are gradually slowly changing. Uh, this was recently uh, improved by Cohen, uh, Cohen, Lee, and uh, Song to show that you can solve linear programs as fast as inverting a single matrix, in fact. But, but one, the, other, the other thing that came out of this is that Vaidya analyzes for things like main cost flow and multi-commodity flow, which, for which the linear system coming out of them are extremely structured. So this leads to the question of if we have some special additional structure to the linear systems, can we get better algorithms? And this also goes a little back further. In fact, the first work on this was by, uh, was, was nested dissection. 
which says that as long as the non-zero structure of the system is planar, we can do something. Uh, with the, the work of Vajra, it led to what's called graph Laplacians. So this is the way you can think about graph Laplacians is that they're Hessian matrices of interior point on single commodity flows. That also motivated a lot of work that basically got runtime that is faster than sorting. Recently, there are, has been all sorts of extensions of this to things like trusses. So this is trusses is kind of like in the, uh, in the buildings. So this is the force diagram on buildings. Uh, you can get to directed graphs as well. You can do them in complex variables. But on the other hand, there are a lot of structures that turned out to just be complete. So while there were a lot of optimism that things uh, in built for graphs can be generalized to much wider classes of problems, there were recently there were these hardness results. So the hardness results actually go all the way back to Itai, who showed that two commodity flow is complete for all linear programs. But recently, these were taken into the setting of linear systems and numerical problems. And uh, they showed that things like two commodity flow, uh, positive linear programs are both complete for solving general linear systems. So the way that this kind of hardness is defined, they define the, the sparse linear system time hypothesis, which states that linear systems with condition number n and z to the constant cannot be solved in time that is better than n and z to the omega. So, Actually, in these papers, uh, the, the, the connection to omega was kind of so considered so tenuous. They actually did all their hardness based on SLTH2 and order one. So can you get better than quadratic? So n and z squared. And in retrospect, they probably did. There's, in retrospect, this, this was a good call in that our results essentially refute SLTH omega order one. So we, re we refute that sparse linear systems require n and z to the omega. But then there's the question of what is a structure, right? What is a useful structure in the general case? And this turns out that, and here uh, there was this remarkable result by Eberly, Gisbrechit, uh, Georgi, uh, Storehan, and Villard. And their key claim here is that the gram matrix of the block Krylov space matrix is what's called block Hankel. So what you do is you have this, we have this uh, block Krylov problem, right? We have G, A, G, A squared G, all the way to the A to the M minus one G. You take the block Krylov space. What do you get? You ju we just take the uh, K, so K is this Krylov space matrix. We take K transpose K. What do we get there? So we get there, the ith row is A to the IG. The Jth column is A to the JG. So you multiply them together, what you get is G transpose A to the I plus J minus two G. And this is a, actually a very structured matrix. What you get is what's called a Hankel matrix. You get a, a Hankel matrix is, is a matrix where uh, after you partition into blocks, you get that every diagonal. So there's two ways to define diagonal. I'm defining diagonal as going, uh, going upward and rightward on your screen. Uh, Every one of these diagonals are the same blocks. Why is this faster? Consider what happens if you do a matrix vector multiply now. A matrix vector multiply in a block Hankel matrix is now hx, the ith block, is the sum over j of these blocks times the xj vector. So m of i plus j over minus 2 times xj. So, so what it is is that it's the, it's essentially the convolution of two vectors, right? You, you think of the x as blocks. You think of the m's as blocks. And the i-th entry, what you do is you take the m vector, you shift it by i, and you take the pairwise dot product. And what you see here is that it's, it's, it's you're taking one vector and you're dotting it, you're shifting it, and you're taking the shifted dot against everything else in the other vector. And what this is, is convolution. You can do things like fast Fourier transform, or if you want to kind of do things up, rip things apart, you can just do fast multiplication. And what you can show is that you can actually compute all entries of this in about m matrix vector multiplies in the blocks. So usually when you do a matrix vector multiply, you need about m squared. And here we're able to get to down to M using fast convolution. And this is very significant. 
we we have we are the grand matrix of a block Krylov space matrix. It's a matrix where you can do very fast matrix vector multiplications. In fact, if it's if if your if your grand matrix is just it, so if if our uh, if m is close to n, essentially you can do matrix vector multiplies in them in about time that is n poly log n, and it's it's something that depends on a block size. I've only mentioned this in the forward direction, though. What about the reverse direction? Oh, by the way, I should mention that uh, Hankel and Toplitz matrices for this kind of property, uh, they are, are extremely well studied. Unfortunately, I actually can't get you a good diagram or a good picture of what a Hankel or Toplitz matrices look like. But apparently, they show up all over physics and signal processing because very often when you have things lined up in certain ways, your uh, pairwise correlations do have this kind of Hankel or Hankel-like properties. So there has been actually a lot of work on um, studying fast solvers for them. So they have, they have what's called fast solver, which is n squared time. You have super fast solver, which is n log squared n time. And recently, there has been a lot of work on getting super fast and stable. But to, a bit to our surprise, there actually wasn't a super fast block solver that is also stable. So what we had to do in the paper is we actually gave a super fast stable algorithm with time that is roughly m times n over m to the omega, which when multiplied out is, 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 where, the, uh, is where the n times, uh, like, like it, it, it is this uh, n times n over m to the omega minus one earlier. So this is also, we need numbers that is about, about log of condition number digits. So how does such an algorithm work? Such an algorithm, what they, so what they really rely on is that they, is that they need what's called displacement rank. Uh, they need displacement rank. So displacement rank, what, what their notion of displacement rank is we talk about low rank matrices, but displacement rank is low rank after a shift. So for a Hankel matrix, right, we have every diagonal is the same. The way to formalize this into a rank condition is you say that if I subtract every element against the one to the top right of it. So we take the matrix, we shift it down by, down by a block right, and to the left by a block. Uh, we get that H minus the shifted version is low rank. It has rank about order S. And there was this, uh, and there's this result from the first super fast solver by, uh, uh, by Caliph, Kuhn, and Morph, uh, who showed that if an uh, invertible matrix has low displacement rank, then H inverse also has low displacement rank. There's actually a very nifty proof of this, which I will skip. But the idea is that once you have this kind of low rank representation, you can apply recursive Cholesky factorization to this problem. So what you do is you take the, you take the entire block Hankel matrix, take this whole matrix, you take the top, top left block, which is also block Hankel. You recurse on that. Then you take the Gaussian elimination result and you can implicitly generate through things like projections and so on. You can generate a factorization of the sure complement. So this eliminated version. So you do Gaussian elimination on here. You get to this matrix. It's still low rank. It's still low displacement rank. You generate that and you recurse again. So the runtime of this, what it comes out to is it comes out to about order log n times the cost of multiplying the top level n by n over m matrix, which we know is by this fast Fourier transform or convolution type thing takes time that is roughly n divided by, um, that is roughly n times n over m to the omega minus one. So essentially what the overall algorithm does is it, it takes the block Krylov matrix. So we take G, A, G, A squared, G, A, A to the M minus one G. We take this block Krylov matrix. We build not just K transpose K, but we also stick an extra factor of A in there. So we get this block Hankel matrix. We build a solver for the block Hankel matrix. And then we return this vector where we solve this, where we solve this, this matrix, and then we just multiply some copies of K and K transpose to cancel this, to cancel these two terms. So the runtime of this, uh, in the rest of this talk, I will show that G with about M cubed non-zeros per column is okay. So the runtime comes out to about N squared M cubed. 
uh, solving H, it essentially comes out to M of these matrix ma matrix operations involving N over M by N over M matrices. And each of them have about M digits. So it comes out to M times N over M to the omega times M, which is about N to the omega times M to the two minus omega. And, what, and then with the way we get a runtime is we just balance these. So we balance this two and the omega with this three and two minus omega. We end up setting M to about N to the 0 0.11 gets about 2.33. And if you want to eyeball this number, you get that uh, this here is, here is exactly 2.33. Two minus omega is roughly a third. It's like 0 0.37, that's roughly a third. So you get 0 0.11, so you, so you, oh, sorry. So it's roughly a third, so you sort of subtract away about 0 0.4. So it's 0 0.37 minus 0 0.4, that's another 2.33 0. That, that's another 2 .33 term. So that's essentially the overall idea. If you want to think about this a little at a little higher level, what we are essentially doing is we're replacing multiplying n by n matrices with convolving m matrices of size n over m by n over m. And the only way that this actually speeds up over n by n operations is that when we deal with these size m matrices, well, with these smaller size matrices, we only need to keep about m digits, which by our earlier estimate, even just the size of these numbers are about n to the m. So even the, just the, the leading bits in these numbers, there are m digits. So the rest of this talk is really just a numerical stability analysis. In that what we need to show, we need to show a very tight bound that about M digits being kept in generating this cry law space is actually good enough for the numerical precision. Any questions before I start talking about numerical precision? So when I am lost, why you had this assumption that A was as sparse? Because when you multiply, I don't think uh, matrix K is any more sparse, right? When you multiply by, so H yeah, so what is I, not So where I need it is, is why I generate this K matrix. Mm -hmm. Why I but generate that doesn't this K mean matrix, K is I sparse, do, right? Yeah, K is dense. K is dense. Yeah. H is some, some other weird object. The reason we need A to be sparse is that to generate K, K still has N columns. So I need to multiply by A against N column vectors. So if A is dense, right, this number would come out to be roughly, um, would, would come out to be N cubed. Because I'm multiplying A against N mm -hmm. vectors. So it's, it's in the construction cost. And this is where the connection with the, this algorithm to counter gradient really comes in. So CG also has the same, same issue, which is that it's really taking advantage of the sparsity of the matrices. I also have a question in the chat about, is the block Hankel matrix low condition number because of the random Gaussian? Yes, that's what we will show. We will show that the ability, picking random Gaussian is what makes sure that the condition number of K and H are not too terrifying. I mean, they're still terrifying, they're still EXP M, but EXP M just comes down to log of condition number. It means that you have numbers with M digits. Other questions? Uh, is an algorithm with uh, uh, is an algorithm with n and z times n within reach of these methods? Uh, I would like to save that until the end because I. I think I'm running a little on time and I want to discuss that at the end as well. There's a lot of things we don't do properly and uh, that's, that is one of the things I think, like it, it seems feasible, but there are some issues, one of, one of which is the number of digits that need to be tracked for these things. Uh, this is at least as good as running uh, n to the 0 0.11 steps of CG. Uh, the solution, uh, think of kappa, so the solution is the, the, the approximation ratio would be 
1 over kappa negative a half to the power of m. Uh, kappa can be n to the 10. So you need, uh, so in general, need m to be bigger than uh, kappa to the or DCG bounds to kick in. So, uh, so there's a question of about uh, uh, what, how does this compare to running just M steps of CG? Uh, so this is using the, the full basis version of CG, not the condition number version of CG. So the, the full basis version of CG is able to solve extremely highly conditioned problems where if you use the kind of the eigenvalue convergence, so like the Chebyshev polynomial bounds from CG, you actually don't get, you don't get this uh, into the, um, you, you don't get this uh, square root of, uh, like you're not able to get bounds that are significantly, you're, you're not able to get bounds that are significantly better than uh, condition number type. So uh, there are some, there's a lot of papers actually on if I run CG, something like order n steps, do I just jump from the condition number type bound to the general like full basis type of bound? Uh, this is where like this is where the the, the, the Musco Musco uh, uh, Sitford paper uh, that, that that's what's really being analyzed there. And I think what they showed there is even if you have a random eigenvalue distribution, you just take an exponential distribution of eigenvalues, some very funny things happen there. Okay, I have one minute to talk, to talk about floating point numbers. So the general idea is we just need to bound the number of digits when working with this block Krylov matrix. And uh, here there are some wonderful results from smooth analysis that say that all we really need to bound is the max versus mean singular value of K. And by what we talked about before, the max singular value, the way you bound it is you just say that, hey, the max entry is just n to the order M. So you just, Get a, you just use the bound on the, on the numbers. Uh, I want to give a slight intuition on how does the mean singular value bound gets proven. So here, first consider the case where the matrix is IAD. So it's just random Gaussian. And the way you prove that is you say that, hey, there's a column. So take fix one column generated last. And you, what you can prove is that the rest of the columns, there's a normal vector. There's a unit normal vector. And if I generate a random dense Gaussian vector, it's dot against that unit normal is at least one over poly n. And the, 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 you can prove, so basically what you prove is you prove, you kind of think geometrically and you prove that every column in your, your, your matrix is likely to have big normal. So a big dot product in the space orthogonal to the other space columns. Uh, you can do the same thing to a block matrix. You think of every column of G as generating, uh, like every column of G becomes A, A times that. Uh, so every column Y becomes Y, A, Y, and so on. So you regroup the block Krylov space so that it's basically the Krylov space of the column separately. And you prove the same thing. You try to prove that each of these blocks is orthogonal to the space uh, uh, or, or orthonormal to it. So the orthogonal to the space that's in the null space of the rest of the columns. And the way you do this is you do a, you, you take a gigantic epsilon net argument. This is where we start losing factors of M is we take a gigantic epsilon net type argument. Uh, we basically get down to the point where we say that, hey, I want to prove the probability of a fixed vector times a Gaussian is small. And the key thing that comes down to it is that you, it depends very much on the dimension of this matrix. It depends on if this matrix has fewer than M or if, it, if this matrix has fewer than M rows, you can only get roughly EXP negative dimension. So the way we actually have to make, we actually have to kind of tweak the algorithm a bit to make this work. And the way we tweak this algorithm to make it work is we actually generate block Krylov space so that there are only about, there are actually, instead of just M extra columns, there are about order M extra columns. There's actually a overhead of a bunch of extra columns that we just fill with Gaussians. So to make the whole epsilon net type argument work, we actually had to go back, tweak the algorithm, pad it with a bunch of dense Gaussians, 
And then we do another step of block Cholesky to make this whole thing work. And what that does is it, it, it makes the dimension of this part to be bigger. And we can prove a success probability bound involving epsilon nets that is much better than that is basically sufficient for our overall argument. Somewhat surprisingly, this actually doesn't change the asymptotics of our analysis. Our analysis actually, there were other steps in here, namely the epsilon net is actually one more epsilon net based on sampling, because we're dealing with sparse Gaussians, there's actually one additional epsilon net that's needed to get the sparsity type things to work. And we feel that, that that's where a lot of the improvement could happen. So overall, uh, what we get is we get that, uh, uh, we, we, we actually needed G about with M cubed non-zeros per column. We think order, we can get away with order M. We think we can actually prove that order M non-zeros per column is also sufficient. Uh, what that would do is it would refute, uh, it would get to about 2.27 with the current value of omega. A uh, couple of you already pointed out condition number dependence. Is this actually necessary? Um, this is a very funny one in that uh, in the case of dense matrices, you can actually invert dense matrices without this condition number dependence. But the caveat is that that result doesn't even use doubles. What that result does is use what's called piadic representations, and it then starts truncating. So what it does is that every fractional number has mod p representations, and it uses that representation to do things. Uh, so that and the dense case, I think, are both very interesting questions. Uh, that at a high, even higher level, there is the question from uh, Murdad earlier, which is what about SLTH2? What about SL, SLTH3? 1.5 and 3. Um, here, Santosh actually thinks that SLTH2 and order 1 is the right question to go for. Uh, I'm, a little, I'm a little more attached to graphs, so I actually think that SLTH 1.5 and 3 is actually the, the more approachable problem. But I think there's a lot of interesting questions there, and uh, I'll take questions at this point. <laughs>